And I move to Brian. Brian, uh, just show of hand here. Who from the entrepreneurs in the room are not from the Arab world? OK, so you'll identify with Brian. Brian, you moved uh, here. We need a mic for you, maybe first. <laughs> you moved here uh, from the US, and you co-founded Duplays. Uh, tell us first about why you moved to the, to the Arab world, and how has it been for you in terms of opportunities and tapping into those? I actually first moved to the Arab world in uh, 2006. I, I was working in, in the West Bank for a nonprofit for a sports and development group. And then I, I knew Ravi and Derv through a friend, the, the co-founders of Duplays, and I joined them in 2008 um, in the first year of Duplays. And so the, the, the culture here w was very different from where I'm from, from New Jersey, from the East Coast. Um, but, but right away, you recognize the same things and the same basic needs. And so I think what, when we started Duplays, we recognized that people were looking to engage with sport, to do something healthy, to not just go to bars or movies or smoke shisha at night, but to, uh, to have a, a healthy outlet. And that seemed to be lacking in a, in a larger platform, organized way. And so we saw the market need, and we created Duplays, and it's been doing so well. So there are no bars, nor movies, nor shisha in Saudi Arabia, and that's your biggest market. <laughs> uh, they closed it down. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> Okay. There's a lot of private companies. All right, so there's Shisha in Jeddah somewhere. Yeah. But so it's a place where it obviously needs your product. Right. And you've been having trouble expanding there. You're just opening an office in Riyadh. How has your expansion to Saudi Arabia been? Because I think this is a very pragmatic example uh, for the rest. It, it, it's, it's been a challenge. We've wanted to start in Saudi for a while. We're starting right now, and, and inshallah, it goes very well. Um, so we. Uh, we find that the, the needs are the same, the demographics are different, and the ways of reaching people are different. I think here we focused heavily on Facebook and people were engaged with Facebook. There it seems to be Twitter is the major way to, to reach people. Um, but as far as, as people's private entertainment or what they're doing, they're on compounds, the, the expats, and, and we're still going to reach did them. You, how did you establish yourself there? You we're, found we're, a we're partner. We're in the process right now. Right? Uh, we, we found a partner at the last Mix and Mentor. No, I didn't mean that, but that actually, that's a, good, that's a good blog. In, in it's the first a, a last Mix and Mentor, but yeah. I meant you had to partner with someone to go on the ground there, right? It's not like yeah. Duplay's going there from scratch. Um, someone, no, thankfully, uh, a, local, a local partner there who's wonderful, who's, whose family's uh, involved with the, uh, the sports leagues, um, reached out to us, and, and through them, we're able to start. Well, fortunately, unfortunately, that's something that's... Uh, common in Saudi Arabia, to, to go to that market, you have mm -hmm. to have kind of a local partner. Yeah. How, how was your experience when you first moved Aramex to Saudi Arabia? That's a big question, actually, for me. It took us 16 years to find a partner in Saudi Arabia. So I kept visiting, literally, 16 years, from 1982 until, well, 14 years, until 1996 that we were able to get a license to operate in Saudi Arabia. Meanwhile, we operated as a freight forwarder, but we were never able to get a license to operate as an express company because it was closed. Uh, and I will not venture into that. And, uh, uh, but we kept at it. So, I mean, you're, you're, you're going to be stubborn and you're going to say, I'm going to operate in that market until you find a partner that says, OK, I can do it for you. Uh, 14 years, yeah. I mean, we, we probably tried six, seven different partners until one of them cracked it. Uh, Joey, uh, you're in the Media Lab. You sit in a place where you see everything 20 years before everyone else. Tell us a bit some of the cool stuff and the trends that you see that could affect some of the thinking from the entrepreneurs in the room. By the way, a lot of what we do is what I was saying being Maoist, which is we don't really know what we're doing. We just do stuff, and then we figure it out later. But... Um, but having said that, I think there's two trends. So, so if you think about why entrepreneurship in consumer internet and software is working so well is the cost of innovation went down. So it used to cost $100 million to try something new. And then now it costs $30,000. That's why you don't have to, these big companies don't have the power anymore. And the startups can do it because it costs less money. And that's why the investors are more humble because they're not giving you as much money and they're more investors, okay? So that's the formula about how we took innovation away from big companies on the East Coast and pushed it into ventures. Now, that's happening in hardware. So hardware, the prototyping cost with 3D printers, laser cutters, that the cost of prototyping is going down to nearly zero and you have desktop stuff. The cost of manufacturing now, what used to be uh, twice a year inventory change because of Aramex and the supply chain guys in China, you can get that down to about 53 or so inventory turnovers in a year. It's amazing. And the shipping is becoming efficient. So, the, so you don't need people anymore. So, so now 
the, the interesting thing is if you look at HP is getting out of hardware because they have a five-year non-agile roadmap. All the agile big companies like Microsoft and um, Amazon and, and um, Google are getting into hardware because now you, agility has been brought to hardware because the co cost and speed of innovation has gone down. But it's going to go to startups starting this year. So I'm an investor in Little Bits, for instance, and we've got a 3D printer company. It's going to be Lebanese. Lebanese yeah. entrepreneur, which um, um, must plug gonna, the Lebanese plug. So I think there's going to be an <laughs> explosion of innovation around hardware. And then the second piece that's coming a little bit later is um, so. Sorry, this is, it's pretty straightforward, but so the Moore's law is about computer chips b gaining in speed, doubling every 18 years, 18 months. That was because of the integrated circuit. Before that, we used to put transistors together by hand. You could only get transistor radios because you didn't have enough yield. You'd add, the error rate was too high. But when you started printing circuits, the errors went down and the volume went up. So genes. Um, right now, they make them in China by hand. You get one error per 100 base pairs, and you only can have a very limited capacity. In our lab right now, we have one error per 10,000 base pairs. We will have half of the world's gene printing capacity within a year, and um, we're going to be going up by 10x. So if you think about how the integrated circuit affected innovation around electronics, we're going to do this with biological devices. So you will see chemical reactions, sensors, computing devices, chairs. We're going to be growing these things out of biological devices pretty soon. And there are a lot of hackers and innovators that are learning about how to make biological devices. This is a few years from now, but testing is also going down. So there's a field called microfluidics. So I went to Vis and saw you, there's a lung on a chip, uh, a kidney on a chip. Every organ that you test for is on a little chip using microfluidics. So if you want to test a new drug, you just stick it into this um, little device and it, it tests so you don't have to do live animal testing as soon. And so, so the cost of testing is going down. So you'll see the, the, all the metrics that we see in, in uh, software and, and, um, and going into other markets like pharma. But, but also you'll see biological devices doing things like affecting the way we think about I mean, like, and, 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 and Costla Ventures is into this, but they, they're making synthetic cheese that doesn't have some of the same problems. So there's a lot of, and, and the crossover is interesting. It's the electronics guys working with the biological guys, working with the chemists, and, um, and it will affect things like packaging, it's, which will affect logistics. And so, so it's all going to start to mix together. So you have to be more interdisciplinary. So is that, do you recommend also entrepreneurs in general to leave room for that kind of interdisciplinary uh, team within them that could potentially come up and land on something different from what they set to do, but through their, their team, basically. Is that something that you do, you do a lot in the media lab, where you have lots of faculty members from all different faculty and all, all different disciplines that interact, and there's the collision of those ideas that come up with it? Yeah, so we have about a dozen startups a year now. I'm creating a startup program. But these startups are like biology and hardware and stuff. But they all have all these different things. So I would suggest you know, adding into these mixers, maybe bring some of the hardware people, maybe pe bring people like Aya. But well, we have some hardware people. So Aya Zaran is here and others are here. But I, I would start to mix the discipline, maybe bring biotech people, because there's some overlap, because they need entrepreneurship skills from other areas. And I think this crossover may be a really interesting thing. So, so I think medical is a huge industry, and it's kind of clunky right now, but there's some real hacks that are happening. So I would, I would mix, mix, mix it up.